I'd like to welcome all of you back again to our class ABC this morning. May God's richest favor, blessing be upon you all. Just last week, we saw Paul's first intention in chapter 3 of Ephesians was to pray for them. But his prayer was interrupted and he began to talk about the mystery of the church in which the believing Jews and Gentiles are both made one in Christ Jesus. Now we call this section a parenthesis and that is from verses 2 to verses 13. So for our today's study, we want to consider his actual prayer, his actual prayer for the Ephesian Christian which starts from verses 14 right down to verse 21. So if you have your Bible, please turn to Ephesians chapter 3 and we are going to read from verses 14 to verses 21. It says here, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height? To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, once again we thank you for your word. May you use your word to speak to our hearts today. Anoint all of us, anoint me and all the hearers. In Jesus' mighty and glorious name we pray. All God's people say, Amen and Amen. For this morning, we're going to look at this title, Bowing the Knees in Prayer. Bowing the Knees in Prayer. Now as we come to verses 14 to 21, we come to Paul's Second prayer in this letter to the Ephesians. His first prayer occurs in chapter 1 verses 15 to verses 23. And now this is his second prayer. His second prayer occurs here, right in chapter 3 verses 14 to verses 21. Now if you compare these two prayers, the first prayer was for believers to know their power. The second prayer, which we will be looking at this morning, is the call for them to use their power. The first prayer was to make them realize what has been given to them. The second prayer is for them to use what they have been given. So let us look at his prayer this morning. Firstly, the first point which I want you to see is his posture of prayer. His posture of prayer. Verses 14 and 15. Notice what he said at verse 14. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees. I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when he say that, he's simply showing, number one, his respect for God. His respect for God. 
For Paul realized that he was in the presence of the Almighty God, that he was in the presence of someone who was much greater than him, one who is higher in ranks, higher in dignity, higher in authority, one who is God, the God of the universe, the God who created all things. So his first response was to bow in respect of him. So not only his bowing speaks of his respect for God, then secondly, his bowing also speaks of his recognition of God. His recognition of God. Look at verse 14 and 15. He says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom, from whom, the whole family, look at the word, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Are you aware that God has a family? His family is found in two places. One is in heaven, the other one is on the earth. Now you may say, who are these people? They are the saints of every age. It refers to those that are safe and have been dead in time past and are now in heaven. And also it refers to those that are safe and still remaining on earth. So these are the ones who has the privilege of calling God their father. And that's what verse 15 means when Paul says, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is what? Is named. In other words, God called them his children. So point number one, we see that his posture of prayer. Then secondly, we want to talk about his petition of prayer. His petition of prayer. Verses 16 to verses 19. Notice from verses 16 onwards, right up to verse 19, Paul was praying for them. That's why he began verse 16 this way. What did he say? He said that he would grant you. That he means God. God will grant you. So that was his petition right there. Now, what did Paul exactly pray for them? He prayed for them three specific things. And it is one building on the other. It is like a progression, a sequence. They are like the steps of a ladder, each moving higher than the other, being built on what has gone before. So that at the end of it all, that you and I may receive, receive what? The fullness of God in our lives. That's what verse 19b says, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. So here you can see this was his petition, his request for all the believers in Ephesians and also for all of us, that at the end of it all, if we follow all these three steps, we will end up having the fullness of God in our life. So what was the first petition that he prayed for the Ephesian Christian? Number one, he prayed for them to have the power, look at verse 16, that he, that's God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with what? With might, with power. Through who? Through his spirits. Where? In the inner man. Can you see the whole purpose of Paul right here? The whole purpose of Paul was to pray that they, the Ephesian Christian, will be strong. They will have the strength. They will have the might that the Ephesian Christian will not be weak Christian. 
Instead, they'll be strong Christian in Christ, in the inner man. How many of you are strong on the inside? I know some of you are strong on the outside, but what about the inside of you? It is when we are strong on the inside, then we'll be strong on the outside. For the inner man is the real you. That's your soul. That's your spirit. That's what 2 Corinthians 4, 16 says. Even though our outward man is perishing. Look at the word. Our outward man. And it says, Yet, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Look at this verse. It says about the outward man. It also speaks of our inward man. Even though our outward man is perishing, yes, we are getting older each day. And you will discover that your body is going to fail you. You will have pain here and there. You know what I mean? Where and there. It means damage. And as I get older, I discover that as well. That no matter how you take care of it, one day it's going to go. This outer body is going to go. The outer man is going to die. That's what life is. And that's what Paul says, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, look at the word, is renewed day by day. So the question now is, are you renewed in your inward man day by day? Yes, you may take care of the outward man, but be sure to take extra good care of your inner man because that is what is going to last till eternity amen now how to take care of our inward man the first way is to pray i will call it supplication you see if you don't pray your inner man cannot be strong now how to be strong if we don't pray, the only way to be strong is to pray. But I know you and I can pray if sin stands in the way. Sin must be taken out of our life so that we can pray. Because sin always kills our spiritual life. So sin needs to be dealt with. Sin needs to be taken away so that you and I can pray. Look at what Job 20 says. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Please note the conditions, the conditions for praying in the Holy Ghost. First, you got to have faith. It says here, faith. For without faith, you can never please God. That's what Hebrew 11, 6 says. Then, not only you need to have faith when you come to God, you need to exercise your trust in God. You also got to be holy. That's why Jude says, Beloved, build yourself up on your most holy faith. So not only have faith, you also got to be holy. If you are living in sin, you will not be able to pray or to pray in the Holy Spirit. So the first way to be strengthened is to pray. That's what we learn here. There's supplication. Because the only way the Holy Spirit can strengthen you is when you supplicate, is when you pray. The second way the Holy Spirit strengthens our inner man is when we read His Scriptures. When we read His Word. That's how you and I become strong. It is the Word. The Word will make us strong in God. You know why Christians are weak? 
today. Number one, they never pray. They seldom pray. And number two, they never read his words. That's why a lot of Christians today are weak. Look at what the psalmist pray here in Psalms 119 verse 28. He says, My soul melts from heaviness. And he says what? Strengthen me, he says. Strengthen me. How? According to what? According to your word. So if daily and weekly, if you are reading his word, hearing his word, studying his word, meditating on his word, and applying his word, you will be strong for sure. All this takes discipline. Look at what Paul says in Romans 7 verse 22. He made one very important point here. He said, For I delight. Delight in what? The law of God. How many of you are like that? You delight in the law of God. He says, For I, Paul says, I, I delight in what? In the law of God. According to the inward man. Can you see? His delight is in God's word. That's what? make each one of us strong in God. So what was his first petition? He prayed for the power of God. Then the second petition Paul prayed for the efficient Christian was what? He prayed for the presence of Christ to be in them. Read verse 16 and 17a. He says, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inward man in order that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. As I have said earlier, this second petition built on the first. So in order for you to have the second, you got to have the first first. I hope you understand that. Notice the first petition. It is that you may be strengthened in the inner man, then Christ, then Christ may dwell. Look at the word, may dwell in your heart through faith. Can you see that? Now, don't get me wrong. You see, the moment a person is converted and saved, Christ takes residence in the believer's life. But the question now is, is Christ at home there? Is he happy right in your heart? The word dwell here means inhabit. It means to settle down and be at home. So ask yourself, is he the Lord of your life? Does he have free access to every room of your life. Do you keep or hide any secret sins which nobody knows? If so, like what verse 17a says, Christ may dwell, not necessarily will dwell, may dwell in your heart through faith. And this is what distinguishes one Christian from the other because some had given Christ a few rooms while others may give him more. For some, he had the whole house while some, he only gave a small little room to Christ. This is why for some Christian, Christ is just present. He is just a tolerated visitors in their home. While others, his prominence, that he's the Lord over some areas of their life, yet other, he is preeminence, that he's the Lord over every area of their lives. So this is what made each one of us 
differs in degree in our spiritual growth. So can you see the progression here? It is a series of steps, one building on the other. So if you do the first step, then you will have the second and then the third. Then eventually you will get to the crescendo, the climax, where verse 19 says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you want that? I'm sure you do. Then do the first step. And that is to get his power. You say, power to do what? Power to overcome sin in your life. That's what the power of God is. That's what Romans 8.13 says. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. You will die. But if you by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. Your spiritual life depends on you. If you live according to the dictation of the flesh, you're going to die spiritually. Yes, spiritually, you'll be dead. But if you mind the spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live spiritually. So what is the first step that he prayed for them? He prayed for the power of God. Number two, he prayed for them to have the presence of Christ. Then the third petition Paul prayed for them is, he prayed for them to have the passion of love. Verse 17b to verse 19. Read what verse 17b says. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being what? Rooted and grounded in what? In love. You see, if Christ is allowed to control every area of your life and in whatever you do, then love will be the result. Then love will be the fruit of your life. Now, why people cannot love? Why they cannot show love? Why? Because of their inner man. Because they don't allow the Holy Spirit to work in their life. Instead, they always give in to sin all the time. And as a result, their inner man, instead of being strong, it becomes weak. Therefore, Christ is not at home in their hearts and in their life. And because of that, they are not rooted and grounded in love. Can you see the progression here? It is when you are building the first step. It is when you are strong, be able to come, overcome your sins. Then you can come to the second step. That is, Christ will be at home in your life. Then the third step. Then Christ will produce the fruit of love right in your heart. So it is not just praying or singing, I want more love in my heart. You won't be able to get that unless you first do the first two steps. That is to be strengthened in the inner man through the spirit and letting Christ rule in your heart. And when he becomes the Lord of your heart and life. Then love will be the result. Then you will end up like Christ, behaving exactly like Him. Then verse 18 and 19a will happen and take place. Then you will be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Now the word comprehend means take possession of. It means to seize, to lay hold of, to understand what the true meaning of what God's love is. Now when Paul mentioned the width, the length, the depth, the height at verse 18, concerning Christ's love, he's not talking about the four features of love. He's actually talking about the vastness of God's love that is so vast that you can't put your arm around it. His love is so great, so vast, so deep, so wide that you stand 
amaze of it. Isn't it true? No matter which direction you look at God's love, it is expressed and demonstrated in four different directions. It is seen in the width, the length, the depth, and in the height. So when you look at the width of God's love, what do you see? You see the way He accepted us, bringing us to be fellow heirs of the same body with the Jews and partake of the same promises. And that's the width of His love right here. And when you look at the length of His love, you see how He chose us right from the beginning of time, even before the foundation of the world. That speaks of the length of his love. Then when you look at the depth of his love, you see how he reached down to us, to the lowest depth of our sins, to redeem us who were dead in tripuses and sins. And that's the depth of his love. And when you look at the height of his love, you see the way he blesses us with all the spiritual blessing in Christ and then seated us together with him in the heavenly places in Christ. When you see all that, you can't help but to thank Him of the way He loved each one of us. And that's what it means by the length, the height, the width, and the depth of His love and the way He saved you and I. No wonder when we come to the last point, which I want to touch on, will be his praise in prayer. His praise in prayer, verses 20 and verse 21. We have seen his posture of prayer, his petition of prayer. Now we want to look at his praise in prayer. Very quickly, number one. Firstly, he praised God for his might. He says in verse 20, Now to him who is able, Able, able to do what? Able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask. That's number one. His might in answering our requests. This means no matter how big your request may be, how difficult it may seem, how complicated it may be, it says here, verse 20, to him who is able, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask. Then secondly, his power is also shown right in our reflection. That's what verse 20b says. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. That's our thoughts life. God is able to do all that we ask, but also what we think in our mind. And this is what made God, God. Amen? So Paul not only praised God for his might, lastly, he also praised God for his magnificence. Magnificence. Verse 21. Firstly, Paul called for us to glorify God personally. Verse 21, it says, To Him be glory. To who? To Him be glory. That ultimately all praise should go to Him and Him alone. Then number two, Paul called for us to glorify God not only personally, but also publicly. Publicly. Verse 21b, To Him be glory in in where? In the church by Christ Jesus. So whenever we gather each week for worship in the church, our ultimate aim should be to glorify God in our worship. Then thirdly, Paul called for us to glorify God, not only personally, publicly, but also perpetually. Perpetually. Verse 21c. The word perpetually means non-stop. It means continuous. That's what our praise should be. Look at 21c. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Notice, 
to all generations. Look at the word. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. Amen. That's what our praise should be. Amen. He is worthy of all our praise. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for blessing us through your word today. May you be glorified always in our lives and in your church. In Jesus' mighty and great name we pray. All God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Amen.